Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we have a coach who's going to walk us through some incredible things about the psychology, the emotions, all the things that go on with a sale. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Josh, for having me. Good day, man. Good day. Good day. All right. So kind of give us an idea of who you are and what are you up to? Yeah. So executive coach, leadership consultant, author, podcast host, uh, just do a lot of things with regards to helping people become the most authentic versions of themselves. So for the last 10 years, I've been working as an executive coach, leadership consultant, and some public speaking. And it's kind of morphed and changed as the years has passed and progressed. It started out as career development coaching, and then it became a little bit of communications training and coaching. Then it became personal branding, and then it was executive coaching. The last two or three years have been really focused on organizational change and transformation. So going into businesses and helping them shift to an entirely new culture. And then this last probably nine or 10 months of 2021, published a book at the beginning of the year and have been spending some time thinking about models around how to get those processes and those ideas and those stories in as many hands as possible. So the core of the business is the same. How do I unlock potential? How do I help people become the most authentic versions of themselves? But the methodologies by which we're showing up in the world are are certainly changing. Yeah. Well, the world changed. For anybody who doesn't know, 2020, 2021, the world changed dramatically, right? Big time. And we have to evolve with that. I like what you said. I, you know, I started here, I became this, I, and then I became this, and then I became, so there was an evolution in your, in your practice. And uh, last time we had a conversation, we, we kind of dug into, you know, the sale, right. And selling, right. Sales and selling. But before we hit that, you have a book and a podcast. This is a good time to kind of give us a plug of what those are and, and why you do those. Yeah, I think, thank you, Josh. The The book is something that was kind of a culmination of 25 years of being a leader and 10 years of executive coaching and coaching. And it's called, I Know, A Practical Guide for Awakening to What's Within and Finding Work-Life Integration. And it's effectively uh, nine chapters, and the, the book is divided into three sections, so three three chapters per section. And the first section is very much about how do you end and let go of an older version of yourself that you no longer need. And then the middle three chapters are about how do you play in this neutral zone of experimentation, right? Really get to create and define who you are. And the third three chapters are about how do you really start to lead an engaged team or become a coach to those people around you? So I designed the book to mirror the process that I normally would help a client or an organization through, but I designed it in such a way that it was a story that someone could read about a client, and then it was the process, and then it was another story, and then it was kind of key takeaways at the end of the chapter. So it's something you can do alone or you can do with people if you do, if you choose to. And so what we recently came out with in April of this year is something called the You and I Know Circle, which is as many people as you want, probably about 10 or 12 individuals that just get together and talk about various ways that they're growing and developing in their lives through the different things that I tried to teach in the book. And so I love to be able to help people probably the same way that you do, Josh. It's like, it's very much, how do we uplift humanity in the book? I designed it to try to do that and to try to empower others to do the same for themselves. So I'm spending a disproportionate amount of time right now in trying to get the book into as many hands as possible or to try to grow the you and I know circle to empower others to become the most authentic versions of themselves as we navigate continual change in society. And my podcast is called Equal Chance to Be Unequal. It's been a little bit dormant for probably the last year because of things with regards to the book, but I'm going to start to ramp it back up. And the ethos of the podcast was very much about how do we find a way to treat everybody or give everybody the same types of information, right? The equal chance. And then to be unequal is to be the most authentic and the most uh, personal versions of themselves, right? So allowing for anybody on the planet to say, okay, I've got access to this information. Which bits and pieces do I want? And then how do I show up for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my colleagues in the most authentic and best way possible? Got it. That's cool, man. So as, as that goes live and as you guys grow and expand that, uh, definitely keep us updated on, on, on the growth of that and uh, we'll help share that message. So in, in your practice, your practice has evolved, uh, you know, writing the book and, and, and evolving to uh, culture and leadership. And, you know, you, you've seen a lot and you've worked with a lot of organizations and a lot of uh, organizational leaders. Now with deal making, right? There's, there's many things that can kill a deal and there's, you know, deal killers, um, kind of walk us through what you've seen 
when it comes to deal killers or things that maybe a deal that we shouldn't have taken, but be, because of who we are, we tend to flock towards bad deals. Like kind of <laughs> give us some ideas in that. Yeah, I think it's really easy to be persuaded by what society says is appropriate and not what we really truly believe to be true and uh, purposeful for ourselves. And so what I try to do is I try to come back to the basics with the client and say, I need you to know yourself. I need you to know your communication preferences. I need you to know what motivates you. I need you to know what your core values are. I need you to know your personal mission. I need you to know what makes you different or unique in the marketplace. I need you to know what might be an emotional trigger for you based on past patterns and behaviors and experiences. I need you to be really clear about what your short and possibly long-term goals are, right? Really, what is your brand in the marketplace? So if we don't have those things set as the foundation, it's very easy to be led astray because we can fall ill to the various things with regards to influence. It's easy to then say, I see everybody else doing this. I should do it too. Or this person just did something really nice for me. I should then reciprocate back to them and do something nice for them. Or I'm having a really hard time right now with money. Maybe I should do this deal just because I need the extra capital coming in. So instead of automatically doing what everybody else is doing, let's take a step back, get to a deeper level of self-awareness so that we can, un we can unemotionally and objectively and in a metrics driven way, make good choices as opposed to jumping on something that might have bad or negative long-term consequences. And so self-awareness and setting a good baseline or foundation is definitely the first step. Yeah. Awesome. So as, as we were kind of discussing that, um, you rattled off like a, a ton of things that you help people kind of uncover to know themselves and to know their place in the marketplace. Right now, when you're working with a client, now, I, I think everybody listening, you know, could start to go, oh, that's important. That's important. Wow. That's vital. That's a bite. And then you, you lay these things in. If people don't know those things about themselves, their organization, their business that they're building, what happens, right? So let's talk commercial real estate. There's thousands of commercial real estate professionals out there. What happens if they don't know themselves and go through that process of what you're sharing? What do they become? they end up becoming very disconnected from their authentic self, right? So there's this, there's this thing that happens for them where all of a sudden now they're taking a bunch of action and doing a bunch of deals and becoming very disconnected maybe from the mission of the organization that they serve, from the core values of the organization they serve, or maybe the vision, the vision of the organization that they serve. They definitely become disconnected from those things, or they become disconnected from those things about themselves. So it becomes very easy to go to that place of taking action simply to take action because others are doing it. So then all of a sudden you become stressed, you become anxious, you become nervous, you become angry, you become sad, right? You end up taking risks on things that are not going to be aligned with what it is that you're actually attempting to do. You're going to form relationships with individuals that you're not actually going to want to be in a deal with. Right? Or you're going to build some sort of a brand in the marketplace that's actually pretty disconnected from the brand that you actually like would like to despise into the, into the universe or into the community. So without knowing those things, without acting in alignment with those kind of guiding statements for yourself or for the organization that you're serving, you end up introducing a lot of conflict into your psychology. Right. And that creates the opposite of happiness. It creates the opposite of joy. It creates the opposite of contentment. And inside of that stress and anxiety and nervousness and disconnection, that's where we end up starting to take actions that are even more disconnected. Right. So years ago, I helped a gentleman who was addicted to cocaine. And what he was doing when he was not acting in connection with his actual mission and his guiding statements was that he was actually starting to do deals that were bigger so that when the deals were done, he would end up celebrating with them by doing lines of cocaine or by doing illegal things that ended up hurting his brand more. Eventually, a couple of years later, destroyed his entire business. So in the short term, we can't necessarily see the impact that unaligned or misaligned behavior is going to have two to three years down the road, it's going to rear its ugly head. Yeah. Now that, that's that example, you know, that, that falls probably on a more extreme case, right? You know, let, let's, let's move towards more of the middle. What are some things that, you know, maybe that I'm doing in my business? I'm, you know, I'm building our brokerage. We're, we're doing commercial real estate. We're investing in private businesses, right? Like, you know, we're, we're, we're figuring things out. We're, we're a small business. We're, we're creating a lot of deal flow, but we're figuring things out. 
I'm not doing cocaine. I'm not doing any illegal stuff. Right. But like, what, what, what could I be doing now that I don't even know that I'm doing in terms of deal making that will rear its evil, ugly head later on. Sure. Yeah. So in, in, when we think about communication, it's, it's very much like I use something called the disc assessment. It's very much how we uh, interact with the world. It's our communication preferences. That's our word choice. It's our tone of voice. It's the nonverbal cues that we give off. And each of the DISRC styles has a different conflict or negotiation style. Okay. So as an example, the D, which stands for dominance, And what that is, is it's how a person deals with problems and challenges. So his or her style for negotiation is competition. So they love to be assertive and get what they want out of the deal, but they're not cooperative. So that ends up alienating people around them, which is a big no-no. The I person, which stands for influence on the disc, their natural negotiation style is collaboration. So they happen to be very assertive and getting what they want out of the deal, uh, but they happen to also be very cooperative. So they end up getting a lot of other people involved too. So that's kind of the ideal negotiation style is for you to be assertive, but also for others around you to be assertive. Now the S in DISC stands for steadiness. And this person, this person's style happens to be accommodation. So they're not assertive in having their needs met, but they're very cooperative in having others' needs met. So everybody else on the team feels heard in that context. Now the C person, which stands for compliance, their tendency when it comes to negotiation or conflict is to avoid it altogether, right? They just don't participate. So they're not assertive in having their needs met and they're not cooperative in helping others to make sure that their needs are met. So if we know these things about ourselves, we can get to that point of understanding how we're going to show up during the conversation, during the deal, during the, during the negotiation. Because when we think about influences of each of these respective styles, it's very easy for a D person, they prefer to be influenced by efficiency. They like to be succinct in conversation. They tend to like new and very innovative products and services. They like to solve problems fast. So one of the ways that we can best help them is to make sure that we give them lots of alternatives in the deal. But if we're negotiating with a high D person and we don't have alternatives or they're not feeling efficient or we're not finding a way to be succinct with them, they're going to automatically sabotage and say no to the deal, right? So we have to find a way to find that middle ground with them is that we have to compete with them a little bit in that deal. Otherwise, it's very easy to walk away. Now, for the I person, they're very easily influenced by showy products and services. They love to socialize during the conversation. Uh, They like to be able to tell personal stories as they're negotiating and doing a deal. They like a quick process, but they can be very easily persuaded away from what it is that they really want if you just talk about supporting their dreams. So if you get into a conversation with someone who's always saying, well, this will support your dreams, this is what you need to do, that's where you automatically have to check yourself and say, okay, they seem to have uncovered my style. How do I now check myself to make sure that I'm not just doing this because they're speaking my language? right? Because that's possible too. Yeah. Now for the S person, they're very influenced by traditional products. They like to be trust in a trust-filled relationship before you get to the point of the deal being closed. They like a slow and easy process. They like repeated conversations and visits. They need additional time to think. So if your style has been uncovered by the person that you're negotiating with, Um, As soon as they start talking about how the deal is going to benefit your family, that's when you want to slow down and say, okay, they've discovered my style. How do I protect myself? Right? Because the S person is a very family oriented. They like to negotiate with people that they perceive as being family. Now, last one for the C, the compliance folks, they're really easily influenced and persuaded by proven products and services. They like to be able to do things that are connected to what's tried and true. They don't like the hard sell. They need some additional time to think. And the thing that always convinces them to be able to buy something is that there's an assurance or there's a fact or there's a figure, there's logic, there's data. So as soon as that's presented, that's when a high C person needs to take a step back and say, okay, they've uncovered my style. How do I make sure that I get other perspectives? Okay. Mm -hmm. So real quick, the D, as soon as they start to get other alternatives, that's when they need to check themselves. The I, as soon as the person starts talking about what's going to support their dreams, that's when we got to slow down. The S, as soon as we start talking about family and how this deal is going to help the family, that's when we need to slow down. And for the C, it's the facts, figures, and data. That's what easily persuades them. So if you start to see yourself getting emotionally connected into any one of these styles, and you see that this person has found your negotiation style and is using it sometimes against you, that's when you want to slow down, 
right? That's when you want to say, okay, let's let's take a couple of days to kind of think through this meeting and kind of look at a couple of different things just to make sure that we're protecting ourselves. And I would always recommend that if your style has been uncovered, right? When you think about how you've just been sold or the psychology of the deal, the best thing is to always walk away from that emotional like environment or that emotion filled environment. And it's just to take a step back, have a conversation with a loved one, maybe a coach, maybe a mentor, maybe someone on your personal board of directors to get that alternative perspective, because I think there's power in data, there's power in patterns. And so if we take that little bit of time to say, okay, this person understands my style, I'm getting really emotionally involved, I need to take a day or two, just take that step back, and then really find my center again to say, does this align with my decision making criteria? And if it doesn't, that's when you need to go back to the negotiation table a little bit stronger. Yeah. So awesome. Now I am high I, like high I with a backup D. I'm like hardly any S and C in my disc profile. So I am, and, and that's probably why I have a, a podcast show and that's probably why I do interview style. And that's probably why I've accumulated great network in, in great relationships. So I'm, I'm high I in this. If I look through all of the past deals that I've been a part of, I have been sold, right? Like how I got sold was people were like, hey, this will be a part of your, your dream. Do this for you know one year, blood, sweat, and tears, and then you'll be able to, to move on to your dream. And what happened is th that never worked, right? I, I got sold into something, but uh, that is, if I look back and, and being honest with myself is there's, there's been times when I don't know if the person did it intentionally, but I was manipulated or I felt manipulated looking back and going, I can't, how, how did I even end up there? I was working, you know, 80, 90 hours a week for this, you know, for this group or this person. And I look back and it was, here's the big vision. Here's where you're heading. I see something for you. Uh, you have potential, right? And I went all in. Wow. That's, that that's really interesting because I can also look at all the great deals that I've been a part of. And it was the same thing, but it aligned with what I was working on rather than just working for someone super awesome. Thanks Michael yeah. for kind of like spelling it out. Yeah. Um, because as deal makers, deal makers like deals and it, the, the easiest person to, to sell or to get into a deal is a deal maker because there's something about the deal. Now, as you, as you go through this with, with a, you know, with a, you know, a leader or a salesperson or someone, and you're kind of walking them through know thyself and you're helping them uncover this, like how, how does this help me get better? Right. So we could look at how do I, how do I not get sold manipulated? How do I protect myself and my organization? But how does this help me maybe on the flip side? How do I grow revenue or grow my company with this knowledge? Sure. Yeah. So you just gave a tremendous example, Josh, about uh, kind of recalling from your own past how the style was used to your benefit and, and maybe sometimes not. And I think that that's very true for each of us. Each of us has a very unique disc communication preference or style. Uh, and so it's always really important to understand how it is that we could be sold by someone else who has this information or an awareness about what we are. But now if you flip the script a little bit and you start to think about Josh as a leader, Right? We have to start to think about how does Josh recognize the behavioral traits of a DIS or C, even if he is I second D. So I would really like to encourage everybody, whether it's you know, something that you'd find for free on the web, or if you reach out to me directly and I give you access to a DISC assessment, um, they're very, very low cost or in some cases free. And self-awareness, self-knowledge is so important in today's marketplace of constant change. We're moving to a place of we really are we're moving away from finding meaning from being a part of a tribe and we're finding meaning as human beings and what our own life's purpose is. And the way that we discover that is through knowing our communication preferences, our core values, what motivates us, you know, those various things that we talked about at the beginning of the show. So what, what I refer to this as is, is mass customization. So if you know these things about yourself and you recognize patterns and behavior about yourself, you're now going to recognize it inside your team, your employees, the vendors, the suppliers, you know, those people that you're doing deals with. So I really encourage everybody to learn these things about yourself because then you start to see the patterns and behavior in those around you. 
And now you can start to positively manipulate those people for collaboration, for compromise, for living the organization's values, for setting up the right strategic goals, for setting up the right culture. Because every person really genuinely wants to be a part of a team that's growing and collaborating towards some big vision, right? People genuinely want growth and development for themselves, but what matters more is contribution to something bigger than the self. And so by knowing your DISC style and by knowing the DISC styles of those around you, you can help guide each team member towards that much larger vision and towards personal growth and development. So in my experience, what I've seen is, is that company culture changes faster when you know respective communication preferences and the risks and the mitigations of a new deal not working out or for the first couple of years after the deal is done, you mitigate the risks faster by being able to open lines of communication by knowing one another's styles, right? So that's the thing is that the greatest teams on the planet are the ones that have each a DIS or C on the team. You need diversity in terms of communication styles and preferences but you need commonality in terms of values or vision. So as a leader, if you can get people who are radically different communicators bought into that common vision, it's, it's an easy win-win for you. Yeah. Now for a growing organization, you know, what do you see in different stages of business where uh, different, different um, personality traits really thrive in, right? So Right here, we've got, you know, we're, we're deal-making company. We've got a lot of deals on the table and such, but we're, we're an early stage business, right? So uh, what, what do you typically see there? What are strengths and weaknesses? What, what, what should I look out for? Yeah. At the beginning of an organization's kind of life, we see the extroverts, the D's and the I's. They're the ones that have a bit more power. They're the ones that kind of make up the largest percentage of that team's workforce. And it's because at the beginning of an organization or a startup or just after a deal was done, you're having to make a lot of decisions and lots of shifts in strategy quickly. And so that's why having more extroverts on the team at the beginning of a business, if you will, is beneficial, right? Probably even better. But after you get past year three, four, or five, and things are starting to settle in, and you're starting to get more revenue, you're starting to have more standard operating procedures, that's where we need to have a pretty large percentage of introverts, right? So extroverts are the innovators. They're the creators. They're the ones that start things. They adjust to change incredibly well. But the introverts, the S's and the C's, they're the ones who are great at completing and finishing tasks and projects. So as the business starts to scale and you start to bring in more standard operating procedures, that's where you need a bigger percentage of introverts, right? So you imagine in the first three, four or five years, you're heavy on extroverts and those people who are creative and okay with change. But after year four, five or six, you're starting to even out the team to have a, an equal distribution of introverts and extroverts. And then after that, you're going to see probably a little bit of a shift towards introversion because the vast majority of the team will be introvert, but the leadership will predominantly be extrovert. So when you look at the way the DISC profile works itself out, the Ds are traditionally the C-suite. The Is are traditionally kind of sales, marketing and, and people relations. The S is very much the operations of a business and sometimes human resources. And the C is like the accounting staff and the engineering staff, the coders, right? So we want to make sure that we have a very fair distribution of that. But as the company gets to be seven, eight, nine, 10 years old, now all of a sudden you're, you're seeing a bigger percentage of introverts because you need that team to be able to manage many of those behind the scenes tasks. Yeah. So you, you mentioned like you, you go into an organization and, and you, you start to help people uncover who they are, their, their true authentic self, which will then create better alignment. Cause you mentioned, uh, here's, here's what you feel if you're not aligned, right? You, you have stress, anxiety, uh, unnecessary risk, bad relationships, bad partnerships, uh, a disconnection where you're inviting or introducing conflict or conflict, yep. right? So those are some of the, the things that that we can kind of take a pulse, right? And we go, oh, maybe I'm, I'm having undue anxiety in my life. And if you're honest, you can take a look at it and you go, why? So then let's work our way back from why I might be having undue anxiety, right? About maybe it's about a deal. Let, let's just say money's taken care of. Let's just say we're making decent money, but our group is stressed out and we could feel it within the group, tension or anxiety. What might be going on? And maybe you could walk us through uh, how you would help. Yeah. The first thing would be is to look at 
depending on the size of the organization, how frequently are they polling their people, right? And really understanding, do they have a best friend at work? Do they have the resources that they need to do their job? Do they feel that their opinion matters? Are they being given updates about their progress as a person on the team? Uh, do their colleagues do quality work with them, right? And so when you think about what people at scale want as a member of a team, they want personal growth and development. They want quality colleagues that they can learn and grow from, and they want to contribute to something that has a much bigger purpose or cause for themselves. So I would start with looking at any type of survey that would be done that's kind of and bigger businesses refer to as an employee engagement survey, but you can very easily do them with smaller businesses too. Just using SurveyMonkey or Google Forms or something like that, you can do those very quickly. And there's something called the Gallup Q12, which are the 12 core statements or questions that if you ask any organization, you will immediately be able to tell their level of engagement and effectively their level of stress. So Gallup Q12 is an easy resource you can deploy right away. So that would be what I would start with. Right. Then next, I would look at it and say, OK, if we got some results there, I would want to look at how frequently the team is meeting and what are the meeting criteria that they're using? What, what are they actually doing inside their meetings? Because if people's voices are not being heard inside those meetings or their needs are not being met inside those meetings, that's a big no-no. So as an example, if, you're, if your organization wants to have solid team meetings or solid one-to-one -one meetings, it's really important that you begin every meeting with your team member being able to say his or her personal or professional wins, right? What did they do in the last two weeks that they feel was a win? They need to be able to share that perspective and opinion. Number two, you as a leader could recognize them or a member of their team for something they did, right? So let the person self-express, but then secondarily, can you as the leader, can you recognize them for something they've done that really attaches to something in their heart? Number three is basically accountability, right? What are those things that they said they were going to do and they did or didn't do? That matters a lot. People need to know that they're growing and developing by you holding them accountable. And number four is a leader. What roadblocks are they having? And so if you as a leader can help them overcome those roadblocks through self-identifying solutions or you removing the roadblock, that's great. But the fifth and probably most important piece that I look for inside of an organization is, is that at the end of the meeting, does every employee go around the table and verbalize what he or she is going to do and by when, right? Because that's, that's accountability at the max because they take personal accountability by saying it, but everybody else around the table hears it. So number one, what does employee engagement look like? Number two, what does the meeting structure look like so that we know that lines of communication are open? And then level three would be at a very individual level. How is it that that individual is doing? Does he or she feel stressed? Does he or feel she uh, feel engaged? How would they rank you know, their time at the organization on a scale of one to 10? So that's where the mass customization that I talked about earlier kind of comes in, is really as a leader, we have to mass customize how we interact with that person to make sure that he or she's working on goals that are really important to them, but they're also really important to the business, right? It's that vertical integration of what the business says is important down to the department, down to the team member, that's the killer. So employee engagement, right? Team meeting structure and those one-to-one -one meetings is the person really developing and growing. So when you step into an organization, like you've been doing this a while, how, how long have you been um, doing coaching and, and working with organizations? 10 years, okay. Yeah. When, you, when you see an organization or, or work with an organizational leader, do you typically feel like, do you feel what's going on in the organization? Do you see things? Do you, are you hearing certain cues that kind of like help you pinpoint really what's going on in an organization? Could you give yeah. an example of that? Sure. So there's um, years ago in the, the old Jim Collins book, Good to Great, like years back in the late 1990s, he talked about a level five leader. And then uh, in 2008 and in 2015, McKinsey emulated the study. And they were trying to understand what is a level five leader or why do organizations not navigate change well? So there are three kind of major reasons why change doesn't work or why stated objectives are not met. Number one, the senior leadership isn't actually bought into the change. Number two is the lines of communication are broken. And number three, the staff members are deeply fearful of whatever the change is because they weren't involved in it, right? So then for me, I'm looking at it and saying, I go into a business and I can have conversation with the CEO or with an administrative assistant or somebody on the front line. And I'm looking for body language. I'm looking for a tone of voice. I'm looking for the things that they say. 
So then after a couple of weeks, I'm saying, how closely are these individuals actually following or living the organization's mission or core values, or are they not, right? So I recently helped an organization that was really starting to do a great job of implementing the right annual strategic objectives and goals, the right performance and compensation structures and plan, but also the right core values. But unfortunately, at the same time as they were rolling those out, the CEO was making choices that were the exact opposite of everything they were rolling out. And so we, right, I was brought in as the executive coach to try to help fix some of the situation. And I told them straight up, I said, this is going to be enormously difficult if the CEO continues to make choices that are the exact opposite of what it is that you're trying to do culturally for the rest of the organization. And that's killer. So it's important that when someone like me goes into a business that we see continuity and behavior from the top all the way down. And if that continuity is not there, the organization is doomed for some sort of challenge or bigger problem. So as, as you're doing this, like, what is your, what is your favorite thing to do with a, you know, a leader or a deal maker, right? You, you get connected with this, you know, person high D or high I, and they're just, you know, they're crushing it out there, but they're, you know, they're starting to have the speed wobbles of life or something like what's your, what's your favorite thing to do when you're uh, coaching or getting involved in their, in their world? Yeah, uh, this is something our society doesn't do a lot of, and this is why I enjoy doing it, is I have them do a core values activity. So when I think about K through 12, and I think about university systems across America, we don't, or maybe until recently, we haven't really talked about what our human core values are. And so what I can do by having a person either through a card deck or through an online activity, I have them go through and identify their top six core values. So they start with 55 cards or 55 online cards And we go through and whittle down to their top six. And then I ask them, what percent of the day are you actually living each of these six core values? And and the answer is almost always less than 25%, right? And it's because, and that's sad, but that's very, very true about society today. We're kind of caught up in, we have to constantly be doing this, this, and this. When in reality, the most joy and the best deals and the best opportunities actually come from alignment with our core values. So when I'm talking to vice presidents and C-suite members or people who are doing deals, I want to come back to the basics of what are your top five or six core values? And then I want you to sit down. One activity I have them do is I have them brainstorm a number of ways that they could live that core value professionally that they're not currently living. And then if they need to, they can go back to their boss and have a conversation to say, hey, can I pick up a couple of projects that are related to this just so I feel more connected? That works tremendously. Number two is, as I have them take their personal core values and the organization's values and put them side by side and draw connections between them. Because if someone can see a connection between their personal core values and the business's core values, they're going to feel more engaged and want to work there. They're going to increase their motivation. They're going to increase their productivity. They're going to increase their efficiency in getting things done. So it's a very simple activity, but it's not one that's practiced a lot in society. And so by doing that, we get to the root cause of stress, anxiety, and nervousness, or we get to the root cause of efficiency, productivity, and motivation, because it's just a percentage of the day that the person's either living or not living the core values. Yeah. And so your favorite part in that is helping, helping the deal maker identify what their core values are, and then find ways to really plug that into the business or the mission there. And then they're running optimally. Like they start, they start to actually get in alignment and get traction in their, yeah. in their own world. That's going to massively reduce stress. It's going to massively reduce bad deals. It's going to massively increase the amount of happiness, joy, engagement, productivity, all of those things. I, I promise you it will. It's, I've seen it happen too many times in the organizations that I've served where they haven't focused on them. And all of a sudden they started to transition and the, the unproductive people fell off the team. And then all of a sudden, the team started to be filled with people who were energized and engaged and genuinely wanted to be there. And then all of a sudden, the team really started to hum along, right? They were making better decisions and choices. There was better client service. Everything that they thought the deal could be, it became, right? So it's an unorthodox approach. But again, it comes back to root cause. And we don't spend a lot of time in society dealing with that. But I think for any person to really know themselves, I think that's a core piece of the puzzle to make sure that they're doing deals that are actually really aligned with them. 
and not just doing it because society says so. That's very cool. So you've been doing this for 10 years. Where, what's the future look like from, from Michael in your coaching practice? Uh, so thanks for asking, Josh. It's when I think about this, I think that the easiest way to describe it is, is that I'm going to become a coach to coaches. And, you know, so I've, I've helped people one-to-one I've helped small departments and teams. I've helped entire organizations shift and change their culture. And I think I'm now at that point of transitioning kind of away from being able to help businesses, if you will, to now I'm going to start to help communities. And, and so I've, I've had this kind of logical growth and progression inside my career away from the individual, the department, or the entire organization to now it's about communities. And so what I think is going to happen is that the you and I know circle, I'll somehow find a way to license the model. Um, I'm just recently moved to North Carolina. And so as I get kind of settled in here and meet the right intellectual property attorney, what I think I'm going to do is take the information inside the book I know license it in some way so that any coach around the world can utilize it whatever way he or she wants to be able to take the same methodology, some of which we talked about today, to then help others, right? This is truly about impact for me, right? This is a way, how can I uplift humanity through the things that I've learned, right? Because there have been a number of things in 25 years of leadership or 10 years of coaching that I've learned that some of the folks who might be just a couple years behind me, how can I give them a hand up How can I uplift them? How can I help them uplift others in a way that really does come from a place of love? It comes from a place of respect. It comes from a place of service. It comes from a place of integrity. It comes from that place of authenticity. So if I can take this model and expand it to be worldwide and genuinely help people uplift themselves and others, I'd feel like I just made the biggest deal ever. Cool. If we took the, 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 the deck of core values and we're, we're shuffling through it. And, and I, and I hold up a card and I go, is this, is this you, Michael, is this you, Michael, right? What would be, you know, kind of your top five, you know, core values that are important to you? Yeah. Yeah. I actually write about this quite a bit in chapter four of, of, I know, uh, cause that's where I tell people how to use the core values inside that chapter. So for me, number one, authenticity, number two, growth, number three, spirituality, Number four, wellness. And number five is wealth, right? So definitely about deals. Uh, And number six is power. So those things for me are enormously important. Uh, There's lots of reasons why. So a separate conversation, I could tell you about why those things are so important, or you could read the book because I talk about a little bit there. But it really comes down to if there's one word that describes me that I just want everybody to remember, it's authenticity, right? I really want people to understand that. So do I understand growth and spirituality, wellness and power and wealth? Of course, but authenticity is my life's work, right? I came to earth this time to be able to deliver hope to people. And that's why I'm here. I want them to become the most authentic versions of themselves. That's pretty cool, man. So as, as we're kind of going through this process, you're writing books, you're creating a scalable model. You want to coach communities and, and kind of take this knowledge and expand it through other coaches and, and to impact more, uh, organizations, companies, and communities, like what, what's a question that I I should have asked you or that you wish someone would ask you, whether it's personal or business that, that you just wish someone would ask you. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, we don't talk enough in society uh, about the patterns of situations in our life. Uh, And so what I, uh, you can ask me, Josh, anytime, or I would encourage you to ask anybody else that you're kind of interacting with you know, always I want people to slow down enough to like ask themselves, what are the patterns of information that are coming to me right now, right? That matters immensely because if you're constantly in go, 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 go mode, you're missing out on the little patterns from the universe or God or whatever you want to call it, right? You're always missing out on those things, right? So always be asking yourself, what are the patterns of information coming to me? And so years ago, I met Beth Comstock, who was the chief marketing officer at GE years ago. So this is probably 2014, 2015, and she's no longer there. But what she said was really important to me. And I'm going to say it just to prove the point is, is that somebody in the audience where I was stood up and asked, you have a a $30 billion budget. No, I'm sorry, a $3 billion budget, right? To be able to market GE. How do you choose where you're going to spend the money? 
And she said, well, I take you know, information from Jeff, who was the CEO at the time. I take the data that we have access via our marketing team. I go to this person and I seek information. So she gave like five or six things that she would do when she needed to make a really tough choice. But what she said after that was the key part. She said she sat down quietly and searched for patterns across all of the information and the data that was coming to her. And when she identified the pattern, that's when she took action. Mm -hmm. And that to me is absolutely critical for everybody. It's like, what is the pattern of information coming to you? Because the pattern is where your power is. Mm, that's pretty cool. What's the next book that you're going to write? <laughs> so the, <laughs> the next book is likely to be called I Belong. Now, so I see this as being a three-part series. I know, I belong, I am. And so I know is basically how do you become the most authentic version of yourself? I belong is how do you, as the really authentic version, how do you create a worldwide community of people that are like-minded? So historically in society, we associated with an organization or with a university or with you know, some other group, some other, uh, we identified as Republican or Democrat, right? Fill in the blank, right? We found meaning by being a part of a group in that way. So now what we're doing is we're shifting in society by not finding meaning by being a part of someone else's group. We are now finding meaning from creating our own tribes that are similar to us. Same core values, same kind of mission, same passion, same interest to give back to the community. So we're seeing this massive shift happen in society right now. So I belong will definitely be about how do you create communities of people who have the same mission and core values that are genuinely trying to uplift that specific section or a group of humanity. That's pretty neat. I thought of a weird question to ask you. Okay. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fire it off. So out of, out of your senses, if you had to lose one of your senses, which sense would you choose to lose? I would be okay losing my sense of smell. Like yeah. for me, it, like it just, I do enjoy smelling certain things, but I think for me, the more powerful way that I identify patterns in my life is through sound and sight, mm -hmm. right? So for me, those things matter immensely. Um, I don't have as strong of sense when it comes to smell, but if I could figure out a way to keep my sight and to keep my ears strong, yeah. That would be amazing, right? Because when I'm with a person, I can pick up really important cues from them via my eyes, right? And I can pick up really important cues in them, their tone of voice, basically via my ears, Yeah. right? And so I always want to make sure that I have those two things because those two things are kind of like my superpower in being able to hear what someone isn't actually saying to me. That's pretty cool. All right. So for the deal makers out there, organizational leaders, coaches, and uh, community leaders, uh, for people out there who want to connect with you, find a way to do a deal with you, maybe ask for some support in some areas, helping them find out who they are, where do they fit, and how do they kind of make that, that big impact uh, uh, by knowing who they are, uh, where could they connect with you and do a deal with you? Yeah. Thank you, Josh. So michaelsseaver.com is the website. Two S's there in the center. My middle name is Scott. So michaelsseaver.com, you'll be able to find podcast, tons of video, tons of media placements, free downloads, three online courses, a lot of information to help you go to that place of clarity. And that's really what I want the website to be is that if you're feeling dis-ease in any way, shape or form, there's likely a resource or something on that website that will get you to that point of confidence and clarity and knowing the right path forward. Very cool. For people listening in, uh, as always, you know, reach out to our guests, say thank you for being on the show. Thank you for sharing your art. Thank you for, you know, talking about these kind of deals to make me better. Uh, reach out to our guests if what they say resonates with you, find a way to do a deal with them. And uh, we appreciate you guys listening in to the Deal Scout. We'll connect with you guys on the next episode. If you're working on a deal and want to chat, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys. How do I stop this thing?